Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Carmen De Cruz. I'm one of the trustees at Conway Hall. Um, I hope uh, I hope you all made it into the meeting okay. I guess you did because you're all here. Um, so welcome. Uh, this is uh, one of our Thinking On series. I think they're Thinking On Thursday for a change. Normally we're on a Sunday. Um, and we've got a real treat for you. So um, I hope you've all got a glass of water and you've been for your safety wheeze and all the important things that you must do when you're going to be sitting in front of a computer for an hour. So um, I've got some housekeeping to go through. First of all, a little bit about Conway Hall. Uh, we are the oldest surviving free thought organisation in the, in the world and the only remaining ethical society in the United Kingdom uh, with our home at Conway Hall in central London. We're a secular humanist charity promoting human reason, secular ethics and philosophical naturalism as the basis of morality and our decision making. So um, today's talk, uh, there will be uh, maybe about half an hour or so and then we'll follow with a Q&A afterwards. If you've got a question for the Q&A, there's a tab at the bottom um, in a little pop up menu that says Q&A. So if you write your question into that and then when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, um, either I can read the question out or I'll pass the microphone to you so that you can ask your question directly to Ian. Um, what's next on my list? Um, so, yes, I'll introduce the speaker. Uh, we've got Ian Dunst today uh, talking about coronavirus and populism. Is this the end of the nationalist uprising? So you might uh, recognise Ian's name. He's the editor of politics.co.uk and author of the forthcoming book, How to Be a Liberal, which, will, which takes stock of the post-coronavirus world and asks if maybe, with a bit of luck, we're seeing the end of the nationalist uprising. So you can get that book. There's a link on our website to it uh, to get on pre-order for a hardback copy. And hopefully, once it's safe to do so, we'll have a lovely book event where you can get your copy signed as well. So, um, oh, and I also need to add in a little donation button. If you haven't already done so, um, to donate to us, uh, we are a charity. Um, and most of our team are on furlough right now, um, but we also completely rely on donations um, and tickets that we're just not getting at the moment because we've had to cancel so many of our events. So if you can donate, that would be much, much appreciated. Um, so uh, also a note that this is being recorded today. Um, so that all the videos will go on to our YouTube channel. We've got a bit of a backlog, but we're aiming to get them all up in the next few weeks. Um, so do keep an eye out for that as well. Right, I think without any further ado, uh, if we can spotlight Ian, uh, we'll just get started. Thank you. Over to you, Ian. Excellent. I'll get, I'll get cracking, really. Um, all right. I mean, look, first of all, I'm going to use the words populism and nationalism basically as interchangeable in this, um, in this talk. They're not really. I mean, populism includes sort of left-wing movements. You would think of things like Maduro in Venezuela. You'd be thinking about some parts of the sort of Corbyn movement. Um, it's not really pertinent to what I'm talking about tonight. What I'm talking about tonight is states, um, and that is overwhelmingly with right-wing populist movements, tend to call nationalists. Um, we live in a nationalist world at the moment. It's not to say that the defeat is total. Lots of countries hold out, lots of parties within countries hold out, and lots of people within those countries hold out. But the truth is that we're in that era. They control the narrative. In the US, the Republican Party is now controlled by nationalists. In Britain, the Conservative Party, Likud in Israel, the Alliance for Brazil in Brazil, um, Liga in Italy, Attack in Bulgaria, the Freedom Party in Austria. Those last three examples are not in control of government. Um, sometimes they're in minority positions, sometimes they get into the government, sometimes they control the narrative from opposition. Nevertheless, the narrative gets controlled just as easily from opposition as it can be in government. Um, law and justice in Poland, Fidesz in Hungary. They are setting the terms of the debate. They're not all exactly the same. Um, some are more pernicious and extreme than others. The most extreme by far is Orban in Hungary. And also, I'd say the most intelligent. Um, in some countries, like our own, Boris Johnson, there's no real ideological makeup to speak of. The times were different if it had been convenient to him in some other manner, as indeed it was when he was London mayor. He would be the one nation Tory, liberal, open guy. That was not the way the wind was blowing, so that is not the man that he became. It was convenient to him to embrace a nationalist narrative, and that is what he did. 
Nevertheless, it makes him typically softer, uh, a bit more subtle about the way he goes about it in ways that have been actually quite noticeable during um, coronavirus. There is also a difference in the manner in which these issues are discussed by these parties. So for instance, despite the fact that there was racialized rhetoric against immigrants during the EU referendum campaign from the so supposedly respectable vote leave camp in their leaflets about Turkey, and also of course from the much less respectable reactionary uh, leave.eu camp, with the breaking point poster, actually after the referendum, it's quite rare to see racialized. Uh, propaganda again in, in the manner in which immigration is talked about. That is not the case in America. In America, Trump has racialized that rhetoric from the very, very beginning. He does so against Mexicans, he does so against black people. And really, even when you take the phrase, you know, make America great again, the most important word in that sentence is again, because what that refers to really is a message to, to you know, some voters saying, we can go back to the 1950s, you know, before everything got shaken up and a bit too diverse for your liking. And it said to other voters, much more recent, usually much younger, including the angry alienated men online, the again didn't mean the 1950s, it really meant before there was a black man in the White House. So they're not the same. Some of them are more extreme, some of them are more intelligent. Some of them are real ideologues like Orban. Some of them like Trump halfway houses. Trump really has almost no consistency apart from one matter, which is his nationalism, which he has held really throughout his life. In the 1980s, it was against Japan. Now it's against Mexico and China. But ultimately, the same instincts apply. He just doesn't have any of the intellectual architecture to try and make that coherent. It's given to him predominantly by Stephen Miller, one of his chief aides and one of the very few people who manages to survive Trump's administration without being thrown out, probably on the basis of the perniciousness of his opinions. Um, Again, then you look at someone like Boris Johnson, you don't see really any ideological underpinning whatsoever. However, despite those differences, and those differences have shone out in the coronavirus debate, I mean, and including in the way that some countries have dealt with it rather well. I mean, you look at Hungary and Poland have not had a terrible coronavirus um, period. Like most places in Eastern Europe and in Central Europe, they had an opportunity, for instance, because it came quite late in March, to shut down by the time that they'd seen things that were happening in other countries. They had a culture that was more amenable um, towards social control, at least more receptive to the idea that government would do it. Um, so not all nationalists have been a complete disaster on this one front. However, there is one thing that they all have in common, which is when nationalism takes control, whether through media presentations or through government itself, it emits a series of lies. I'm going to talk about some of those lies now, not all of them. I'm going to talk about some of them. The first lie and the most important lie, and the one that is present in every single nationalist country and every single populist movement, is the idea that there are two classes of people, um, the people and the elite, and that these two classes are in fundamental opposition to each other. Now, as a matter of fact, none of these classes exist. There is no one single elite. There are various centers of power in politics, in economics, in trade, in culture, in media. They sometimes go together and they sometimes pull apart. There is no one elite. There is no one thing called the people. The people are not homogenous. They are individuals. They are extremely eclectic and diverse. They have very strange opinions which you will never be able to predict on one single person, right and left, libertarian and conservative. The idea that there is one singular thing called the people, a homogenous blob of purity, is a very old one. It goes way back, but its modern incarnation is with a man called Rousseau, who's a sort of lunatic Swiss philosopher who lived most of his life in France. Um, his system of thought was essentially wrapped down to the idea that things are terrible, um, have always been terrible, um, and always will be. Um, and there's really very little that you can do about it. Uh, and that philosophy made him extremely unpopular, um, not least with the Enlightenment philosophers of his time. He eventually went quite completely insane. Um, he sort of ran around Europe, terrified that there was a league of malevolent Enlightenment philosophers who were out to kill him, found sort of safe harbor with David Hume. Hume took him in um, until eventually Rousseau decided that Hume was also trying to kill him. Uh, Hume said of him, um, he is like a man who has not only lost his clothes, but also his skin, which is not the greatest description that anyone could have applied towards you. Um, Rousseau had an idea called the general will, um, which sounds quite democratic, uh, but actually is quite, 
quite an alarming theory. Um, it's not the majority view in a country, it was different. It was that in the right conditions, geographical, political, historic, um, especially this idea of virtue, you know, where people had sufficient virtue to them, um, they would have a sort of moment of kind of transcendent collective consciousness where they would understand the right thing to be done socially for all people. And that only when this general will was expressed could a nation be called properly legitimate. Um, that was the beginning of the idea in the modern period of the will of the people. In the years that followed, in the centuries that followed, this idea became very popular um, with a series of men. Uh, among those men was Robespierre and Stalin and Hitler. And generally speaking, any time this idea was taken up, an awful lot of people died. Um, and before you start, I'm not suggesting that, you know, Donald Trump or Boris Johnson are the same as Stalin and Hitler. What I'm saying is that these ideas are pernicious and any time they are expressed, you are heading in an unfortunate direction, which you'd be well advised to hold. The idea of the people versus the elite um, is quite singular uh, if, for the simple reason that it is false. And as soon as that becomes the framework of your political discussion, you are dealing with a world that is handled in its falsity. That's why now we seem tremendously surprised when truth seems to have no purchase in debate, when the sense of honor, the sense that you, know, you would get in trouble, that you would be liable to suffer consequences if you said things which were untrue no longer holds. The reason it no longer holds is because the framework of the manner in which we discuss politics has fundamentally changed. It is now an entirely fictitious narrative. And yet even so, day by day, you will see nationalists try to discredit the idea of objective truth. They would do it on small things and big things. You know, Trump started lying you know, as soon as he was elected president about the size of his inauguration crowd, an almost comedically sort of facile thing to, to lie about. He would also lie about much more substantial things. Uh, Steve Bannon, the man who ran the Breitbart website, white nationalist website, an absolute abyss of filth, um, and of course was working for Donald Trump in the White House for a time before he sacked him too, called this the flood the zone with shit strategy. It's just to, lie, to just churn out the lies, to just flood the, the environment with lies that the people can't even pick up on any one thing. They can't assess any one moment. The media are completely lost for words. The same thing was done with policy, particularly on immigration. You get similar behavior from the British government, not quite with as much malice and viciousness, but nevertheless, the, the ultimate structures are exactly the same. The end of the Brexit nightmare that engulfed us for all those years and continues to engulf us now in a slightly lesser form. Um, Boris Johnson capitulated on a deal with the EU, which would have seen the UK's customs territory carved in two between Northern Ireland and, and the rest of the UK. Um, for months afterwards, including during a general election campaign, that border simultaneously existed and did not exist. Now, for most members of the public, that was quite an esoteric sort of issue. They didn't really care. Um, but what had happened is that the entire basis of Britain's trading life now existed in a world of half-truth, not even really half-truth, two simultaneous sort of fictions. You could believe one or the other. The border existed and simultaneously didn't exist. The Brexit department believed that it existed. The prime minister insisted that it didn't. So falsehood just sort of engulfed us. In the background, there was in the second level of falsehood an attack on objective truth, which took place through discrediting of independent agencies. In Britain, that process started predominantly, um, or at least found its most famous expression in Michael Gove's statement of we've had enough of experts, in which he didn't just say the British public had had enough of experts. This is in 2016. He also said that experts were making money from telling people things that was objectively empirically true, that they were essentially in a conspiracy against the people. In the US, that usually takes the form of a phrase called deep state. And deep state is basically the structure underneath um, that tries to lie to you by basically presenting objective truths. It follows from the narrative um, that issues are always simple and not complex. The nationalist world is a world in which complexity is completely rejected. It simply doesn't exist. There is just very simple answers, usually socio-cultural answers, for what a complicated problem, usually socio-economic. Um, anyone that attempts to tell you otherwise is, again, in a conspiracy against the people. Usually you need targets, enemies, that explain to you why it is that the policies that are then adopted on the basis of that fictitious narrative completely fail to work. 
Um, the enemy is usually the elite, so judges, journalists, you know, metropolitans, people that live in cities, liberals. But also usually there's a target outside of that group. Um, and it's been like that throughout in history. Very often the target has been Jewish people. Very often the target has been gays and lesbians. In our period, overwhelmingly, although those two groups are included with alarming regularity, it is immigrants, immigrants everywhere. You know, when you're in Brazil, it's immigrants from Venezuela. If you're here, it's immigrants from Eastern Europe. If you're in the US, it's immigrants from usually Central America, sometimes South America. So the immigrant is targeted and blamed for all of the ills which society faces. And in some grotesque inversion of reality, the more the nationalist fails, the more it can then be blamed on the immigrant again for undermining the will of the people. There's one final part, one final lie that operates that's pertinent to what we're talking about here. And that's on the separation of powers. Separation of powers goes back all the way through the modern period. It starts, I mean, it sort of starts in all sorts of places, but one of the key points is a leveler um, and army document um, during the English Civil War, when the army was trying to sort of bring the king and parliament together. It's called the Heads of Proposals. And they just look and go, well, we can put this bit of power here and this bit of power here. Now, that was the beginning of an exercise to say that executive power must be restrained. It must be put in various locations. That's crucial to any kind of free society. John Locke, the English philosopher whose father fought on, inside a parliament on the Civil War, took that up himself between the legislature and the executive. That was then taken up by Montesquieu, um, the legal jurist, and followed through in its sort of perfected form by the US Constitution, looking at power being separated both at the local and national level between states and uh, federal government, and then also in three directions at least within each of those centers. So the legislature, um, the executive, and the judiciary, the court. Um, nationalism has no time for that idea. Uh, it follows from its logic that if the will of the people is pure and homogenous and they are the expression of that will, then anything that gets in its way, that interferes with it in any manner whatsoever, is illegitimate, is invalid, and therefore the institutions are attacked at all times. The media, which grew into one of the, you could say like the fourth institution, is attacked at all times in Trump's America and in Britain, extraordinary blacklists um, of journalists, including you know, some of the most popular morning TV shows, that the crazed radicalism of ITV's Good Morning Britain somehow warrants a mention for a, a Downing Street blacklist. Um, the same goes for the courts, you would have seen I me mean, very early in the Brexit process during Article 50. As soon as there was any court case about Brexit, the first thing that happened the next day was newspapers coming out saying, you know, um, enemies of the people for the judges. The same thing for the parliament. Um, same thing for NGOs. I mean, Salvini in Europe constantly talking about non-governmental organizations as a threat to the will of the people. Um, same thing for bodies of experts, scientists, um, anywhere that holds any ability to constrain executive government. Um, public health agencies, as we will, um, as we're going to come to. I'm doing okay for time. So, what happened when coronavirus hit the nationalist movement? Um, the answer is bad things. I'm going to look at three examples. Um, I'm going to look at Bolsonaro in Brazil. I'm going to look at Donald Trump in America, and I'm going to look at Johnson here. Um, in each case, what you see is a failure to grasp and a rejection of the existence of objective reality and the policy failures that follow from that, the consequences that follow from that, and then what we can do, um, what we can learn from in the next few years on the basis of it. And this is not a prediction. There's any number of ways in which this can go in a different direction to the manner in which I'm speaking. Predictions are for fools, especially right now. What it is, is just trying to highlight what works, what doesn't, where there are vulnerabilities, and what the last few months have demonstrated to us. Bolsonaro's approach towards coronavirus has been essentially to pretend it doesn't exist. He called it a little flu, and he said that it's a, these are all quotes, media fantasy, um, a media stunt, uh, called it a myth, he attacked doctors for saying it was true. He attacked scientists for saying it was true. He attacked the media relentlessly for saying it was true. Um, he described the masks with homophobic slurs and sort of roughly translates as they're for fairies, sort of suggesting it's not macho to, to wear a mask or even really to believe the coronavirus exists. Um, he operates by having a tremendous arsenal of disinformation behind him. 
very often run by his two sons, by his business interests, which turns out there's information about political opponents. Um, it has done the same thing during this period. Uh, you will see Brazilian lawmakers, hundreds of thousands of followers, putting out information saying, well, look, these photos, these images you're seeing of these graves, th these are all completely faked accounts. The entire thing is a media stunt. Bolsonaro himself won't surprise you to learn, given the fact that he doesn't believe it's real, of course, caught coronavirus, the thing that he previously said did not exist. Um, and is now, I think it was on the 7th of July, so just, sort of just over a week ago, was on Facebook taking... Um, a drug that's going to figure, unfortunately, sort of quite, um, quite frequently in, a, in our discussion, um, hydrochloroquine, with a name that I seem to find impossible to say, and I don't particularly want to learn. Um, and took a video of himself taking it and saying, well, that's it, I already feel better. There are a couple of obstacles towards him uh, pursuing this strategy. I mean, the first one is that Brazil has a national health service that's actually modeled on the NHS, it's called SUS. It's very good, actually, especially in Latin American terms. Um, national health services, especially ones that are free at the point of use, are tremendously helpful during a pandemic, for some obvious reasons that I won't bother going into, but for some less obvious ones. The first one is if they're properly formed, they give you some kind of local flexibility, but also a national posture in which to sort of implement your health policies. The second, which applies especially to poor countries, but would apply anywhere, is that when you take away people who sense that they're going to have to pay, they're more likely to go to the hospital. So that way you're actually going to have a much better chance of seeing who's got the disease and being able to do whatever you need to do to isolate them if they do, um, or even to treat them. Uh, the health service was, of course, attacked. The first health minister who tried to sort of build private hospitals, tried to build emergency hospitals, um, uh, was sacked. Uh, the second health minister came in. They lasted for four weeks before they also had to go. Um, in both cases, because they were trying to do things, literally because they were trying to tackle the coronavirus. Uh, the third person that came in was a military general who had no experience um, of health matters, and his job was essentially to do nothing, which is precisely what he has done. Brazilians were then caught in a situation where you had the president saying that this thing didn't exist, all of these dead bodies were sort of fictitious, um, and local authorities. So there's 27 uh, governors in Brazil who are desperately trying to do what they could in order to essentially act as, as, as the national government over their area. Um, they have done what they can. 20 out of 27 of them have written a letter um, condemning Bolsonaro's approach to what has happened. Uh, the death toll in Brazil is currently 73,000 people. Trump, actually very similar, um, I mean, at various points seemed to suggest that uh, the disease did not exist, that it was about to disappear. He said that the rates were falling when in fact they were rising or plateauing. Um, he again went in for the drug um, hydrochloroquine. Um, it's extraordinary that I can never say it. Um, and in fact was quite aggressive when anyone stood up against him. His chief scientific advisors would basically stay silent. Um, several parts of it, when one figure who had the lead um, in trying to provide a, a vaccine blocked efforts to promote it, they got rid of him. Um, at another moment, Donald Trump suggested that you could use light or the injection of bleach in order to cure yourself um, from the disease. Again, because there's such a fear of being sacked, the moment that you say anything that goes against Donald Trump as chief scientific advisor, it stayed pretty much... Um, pretty much silent. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, in an extraordinary media moment of institutional failure, um, put out this sort of cryptic tweet afterwards saying, um, you should always follow the information on the label. You know, didn't have the confidence and have the guts to just say, don't inject yourself with bleach. Was too terrified of that. Um, these were some of the lies uh, which are told. More pernicious still, I think, um, was the attacks on institutions. Now that had started very early with Donald Trump. It started pretty much before he came in and when there was a sort of transitional phase between the Obama administration and the Trump administration, there was absolutely no interest at all in what any of the agencies or in any of the previous administration had to say, even on issues like terrorism, on financial regulation and on disease control. Um, so disease surveillance, was mothballed, was, was pushed away. Uh, the figure who would have been the head of pandemic surveillance, sort of handling a pandemic if it hit America, which it later did, was gotten rid of as well. The CDC, uh, there was an effort by the administration to strip it of its funding. 
that failed because of Congress, but they did take away from the public health surveillance. They basically gutted it, uh, that element of it. And then Trump put one of his uh, sort of loyalists in charge of it, um, a man called Robert Redfield. Uh, Robert Redfield is a sort of spectacular imbecile. Um, spent most of the 80s saying, you know, that the HIV was due is a result of immorality and going against God's will and all that sort of thing, Monday Jumbo. Um, and is now, you know, in control of this major agency. In control of that major agency, what he's done is a series of catastrophic um, and inept decisions, including pursuing, and this will probably ring a few bells uh, for those who live in this country, um, including pursuing, you know, a bespoke uh, national testing regime rather than taking um, the WHO approved uh, testing kits from Germany. The WHO itself also came under a sustained assault. Donald Trump left the WHO, starved it of any kind of funding from the US. Same thing, by the way, happening with Bolsonaro, who have called it a partisan organization. Trump was warned um, on February the 14th. Uh, I mean, obviously he had warnings before then, but he was warned in a memo that actually gave an example of what it was that he would need to do on February the 14th, or else there would be extraordinary numbers of deaths and ex uh, terrible economic consequences. It was essentially a mini lockdown he was asked to do. Not quite what we ended up having, a little bit short of that, these were still the early days. He was basically told you need to cancel sporting events, you need to encourage people to work from home, you need to consider closing the schools. Trump ignored it um, and called it hysterical, he said it was all made up, um, and it was only weeks later that he actually went into lockdown. This period, uh, the February-March period, is of crucial importance. The disease can spread every two or three days, it, it doubles. So those early moments were the moments when the event a large reason for the eventual death tolls were established. Trump moved extremely late on the basis of not believing in the objective reality that was being presented to him and his lack of failure, his lack of confidence in government organizations by virtue of the fact that they're intended to scrutinize and to advise power. The death toll in the US is 138,000 at the moment. The UK is not as bad. Um, I mean, Boris Johnson has the considerable advantage of the fact that he has at least acknowledged the coronavirus exists. And that seems like a very, very low bar for anyone to jump. But nevertheless, it's a bar that the other two figures at least have been unable to get over. Um, he has also ostensibly said, well, we trust in the science, um, which is an improvement on where he could easily have gone. Nevertheless, we haven't really had much access to the science. In fact, many of the complaints that come um, from epidemiologists who sort of say, well, look, I mean, it seems to be mostly based on modeling rather than public health criteria. The information there is sorely lacking. What also was lacking was a sense of the government having any interest in international comparisons and what other countries were doing. There were plenty of examples, especially in March, where things were getting heated over Europe, but countries were locking down. The same if they had looked at countries like Korea or if they'd looked at Singapore. They would have seen strong examples of how to follow. There was no interest in any of these matters from the British government. Instead, Boris Johnson said at the time, um, this is a land of liberty, a phrase which had no pertinence, no relevance whatsoever to the situation in which he found himself. Professor Neil Ferguson, who was later taken away from his post for a far lesser crime than that committed by the Prime Minister's special advisor, senior advisor, I beg your pardon, um, said that at that point, if Boris Johnson had locked down one week earlier, it would have halved the death rate. He acted late. When he acted, we saw a similar pattern, um, less ferocious, but a similar pattern to what had happened with local government in the US and in Brazil. So local public health authorities uh, denied the data that went into the modeling, denied information about people, um, how many people in the local area had called NHS Direct uh, with the symptoms of coronavirus, denied information in the initial stages, I think up to May, um, about the postcodes of the people that died, which would have at least allowed them to do some kind of basic tracing system to see in areas like Lozelles, where there were clusters of deaths and try to do something about it themselves if the government wasn't, because the government wasn't. The testing system completely failed to exist um, and was restricted to hospitalizations. Um, they also didn't take any real lessons um, from the WHO. The WHO came up with eight symptoms, which included nausea, uh, and vomiting that for people to, uh, to, to look out for and to test for. Um, uh, the British government ignored that. It only added one later on, uh, again in May, on sense of smell and taste, way after any of the information had come out. The same thing happened with, um, with uh, tracing 
uh, where again, I mean, this was stopped on the 12th of March. This goes against almost any of the advice you hear from any of the experts in the field to say that the most rudimentary, the most basic thing you do is this. And then nevertheless, it was closed with promises that later there would be a world beating. World beating is the phrase that Boris Johnson uses with quite tedious and brain freezing regularity. Um, uh, contact tracing app. That app, when it, as it was being developed, expert after expert almost uniformly said that this is not going to work due to various sort of requirements that are held by the companies in which you needed to operate on mobile phones. This was ignored for a substantial period of time, a classic way in which this government operates, until it eventually accepted it and the project fell apart. We don't know when anything like that is going to be available to us now. The death toll in the UK um, was 45,000 people. All three of these figures have seen um, quite severe declines in their polling. Um, their approval ratings, actually almost identical to each other, are always between the low to the mid 30s for the handling of the virus. Um, these are significant drops. I mean, in Bolsonaro's case, the biggest drop has been with the very well off. He's actually managing to maintain a lot of his support with the very badly off. Um, Trump is looking at some of the worst uh, polling anyone's seen while about to go into an election fight. Um, Boris Johnson still, ahead, I mean, latest polls still putting, you know, the party 10% ahead of uh, Labour, but nevertheless precipitous decline from where he was just a few months ago. Severe damage. That is not to say that that is where we are and that these guys are now defeated. That would be absurdly naive. Um, that is not the case. But we have learned certain things. The chief thing that we've learned is about values. In 2016, when we got the sort of double punch of Brexit and Trump, um, a lot of people came up to say, well, you just need to give up on this stuff now. You've got to give up on the idea of object, you know, objective truth. Like, you know, perceptions are all that matter now. Control the perception is how to win. You've got to give up on this idea that the people in the elite is a fiction. You have to embrace it and represent yourself somehow by this different thing, or worse, just accept the, the policy proposals, you know, essentially go into a culture war with what is dispiritingly constantly referred to as the white working class, as if there are no non-white working class people. In fact, that is not the lesson to take from what has just happened to us. What has just happened is that in an event like this, objectivity matters. Objective fact and empirical reality matter. When it comes to people talking about their loved ones, when it comes to them being trapped at home for months on end, when it comes to them thinking that they might lose their jobs, suddenly objectivity is an incredibly important thing and evidence and reason and scientific information become pertinent once more. We've seen the same with the attacks on minorities. Again, always in history, the minority changes in our period is predominantly immigrants. And yet that is not how it's been for the last few weeks, for the last few months. Immigrants, these people that were constantly talked about as if they were a problem, as if there was something to be fixed, who were talked over rather than to, are now something else. They're now essential workers, essential to the country, essential to running society. Now that change did not happen out of nowhere. It didn't just happen because of coronavirus. That has been happening in a steady state in polling for some time, for over 10 years now, where immigration has been dropping in salience, it's falling from about the most important thing people cared about, about 2010, to now about ninth. And it's rising in popularity. The number of people who think that immigration has been good for this country was just 19% who believed that. Now 10 years ago, it's now over half. Now, that process has been happening for some time. It didn't stop because of Brexit. Um, it happened when we look at the evidence over and over because people heard the message. They heard the message that immigrants were good for this country. They heard the message that the things that the newspapers, the tabloids would say, especially right-wing tabloids, was nonsense because people stuck to their values and kept on saying what they knew to be the case, kept on making the case and refused to buckle when other people insisted that they should. Um, we also have it because we have refused to accept the narrative of the people versus the elite. By refusing it, you put yourself in a position to challenge it when the moment occurs. And now suddenly, a moment has occurred. Because the nationalist governments have something which 
it's actually very difficult for their narrative. They tried to pump out the people versus elite narrative during coronavirus, Donald Trump especially desperately trying to do it. To some success over there, not that much, and certainly to no success over here. Um, but it doesn't quite work, and the reason is simple and potentially devastating for the nationalist movement, which is they are now incumbents. They don't get to say that anymore. They are now in charge. This is on them. There is a certain kind of liberation and a certain potential for victory that comes in defeat. The moment that you are so firmly out of power as anyone who challenges this stuff has been out of power, realistically since 2016, arguably earlier than that, if you look at the sort of messaging around it before the hits really came in. And in that position, when you are the barbarian at the gate, rather than the status quo, the establishment figures, you have the potential to make them own it. Now we've seen the way that they behave, we've seen the failures that they've done, and we've seen the manner in which those failures are very often attributable to the precise messages that they put forward as their reason for governing. On that basis, they can be made to own it. And over the years which follow, the next three, four years, as things get pretty grim economically, and we potentially see more of this, that will be an absolutely essential thing for us to be doing. That is how to punish them. And that is how to try and change the situation so that we can help people rather than leaving them in this frenzy of myth-making and inadequacy. Okay, that's me. It's actually relatively cheerful for me. But yeah, that's my speech done. Hello. Right. Uh, always on mute. I, um, I always miss that button. <laughs> that was... Uh, that was um, yeah, that was cheerful. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got a few questions that have come in already. Um, and I'm going to read the first one out because it was sent in by an anonymous attendee. Um, so if millions more people fall into unemployment in the coming months, they may become very susceptible to nationalist rhetoric and simple answers. Do you expect to see any group successfully counter this or even use populism for good, both in the UK and more widely? Um. I mean, I'm going to be a danger of repeating myself here. You're exactly right to think, um, whoever you are, um, that the, the economic hit can easily be taken as part of the culture war, as part of the sort of tribal attack. Um, that's more, to be honest, that's much more conducive material, typically speaking, than a pandemic, which demonstrably hits everyone, even, of course, though there's a sort of class structure underneath that that makes it sort of essentially less damaging for white-collar workers than it is for blue-collar workers. Um, the people that can stop them from doing that are us. I mean, it's not that there is no one sort of group or movement. It is people who don't believe in those values, who still cling to the idea that we are individuals and not just classes trapped in animosity with one another, who still believe in evidence, um, and who still believe in protecting minorities. Those are the ones who can make the change. And at the moment, we have much greater capacity to do that than we had before. Um, now, sometimes that happens within parties. You have to hold parties to their position. Some of the most heroic work that's been done in British politics recently has been within the Labour Party to try and drag it into a, a position where it can be effective. And some of that, a lot of that was done by people who think a lot might, like me. A lot of that was done by people who don't think like me at all. And actually were quite popular. You know, people who were on the left who supported Jeremy Corbyn and realised, no, actually, this isn't working after the last election. So it can be done. You just have to stick to your values make the case, make the argument, don't be ashamed of them, and don't let them win. Great, next question is from Kerry, I'll hopefully unmuted you. So this is for Kerry. Hi. Um, yeah, my question is, um, I'm, I was interested that you've kind of used nationalism and populism interchangeably and um, and I wondered where you would put the SNP as a party on your kind of, um, you know, in amongst that, because um, it strikes me that, you know, the SNP are nationalist. They're, so say, a social democratic party. Um, there are elements of populism. You can see um, how they pose, um, they counterpose the Scottish people against the Westminster elites and that kind of thing. And I just wondered where they fit in what you've said. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And, and once upon a time, I would have just said they're straight nationalists, you know, with a with a sort of centrist, sort of centre-leftist bent. Um, 
And there is a complication there, you're right, like the constant attempt to portray so, um, Scottish voters as fundamentally different to English voters. I mean, most of the time when you look at polls on values between English voters and Scottish voters on things like immigration, you know, it, really not that different, um, even if they did come out very differently on sort of the EU. Of course, the EU was just a sort of totem, you know, treated as this culture war symbol. It's not the only thing. Um, and there were plenty of uh, sort of SNP supporters who voted for Brexit at the same time, who were basically just, let's kick the system voters. Nevertheless, obviously, the SNP are fundamentally different in that the rhetoric that is used, the fundamental narrative of the people versus the elite does not figure prominently or barely at all um, in any, and certainly the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon. There is defense of institutions. There's a, a consistent reliance on empirical fact. And on that basis, they do have to be treated as, as fundamentally different. There is also, I think, a slightly different sort of historical context to it. But when you're talking about an independence movement, as it happens, I, I don't agree with Scottish independence. It's, it's not for me. Um, but nevertheless, that puts you in a different footing to, for instance, if you're an English person talking in those same terms about the English, because there is no policy platform that you're trying to achieve, no basic constitutional platform which maps onto these ideas. So it's not a neat, it's sort of like, it's not a clear cut answer one way or another, but I mean, it, it would be, I think, grotesquely unfair to them to just lump them into that category when on the basic values, they ultimately do sort of stick firm to. Them. Oh, next question is from Ben Jones. I've just requested to unmute you, Ben. Uh, hi, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, hi Ian, I, I wanted to ask about, you mentioned earlier, uh, Auburn, and um, in you've got the three case studies there of the US, Trump and Bolsonaro and, um, and the UK. And, and Auburn, for me, I, I completely agree with you, um, represents that kind of populism. And I've got colleagues who work in Hungary. And I wondered what you thought the difference has been in their relatively well handled response to the coronavirus and low volumes. Um, is it because of the relative concentration in Budapest? Is it because they've got quite a spread out population? Is it because there's a relatively joined up response from the EU? I, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of work being done on this. And look, every, everything, take it with a pinch of salt, what I'm going to say, including kind of, kind of everything on coronavirus, because we're still in, in the heat of it. Um, so some of the work suggests that when it went into, it's not just Orban, obviously, or, or Poland. It, it's all of Central um, and Eastern Europe have handled it very well, up to and sort of including Austria, really. Although Austria, even Austria had a harder time, I think 10 times the death rate. Um, so partly some people say that it's because the initial cases came in with sort of quite actually quite wealthy young people, presumably from ski resorts, so they think the initial clusters were. Um, so there wasn't such an immediate effect because actually old people got it much later. Secondly, that it came in late and it reached them, literally, literally reached them in March when we were all quite aware of it and that already had two months to see an awful lot of stuff happening in uh, Western Europe. Again, people talk quite a bit, it's a questionable presumption, but, but probably, you know, intuitively feels quite sound that there's less of a cultural hang up about lockdown. I do want to say something different about Orban though, because um, he's quite a complicated figure. He is um, quite prone to discard sort of elements of the populist regime when he thinks that it's a requirement. Um, he's extremely canny. If you follow him in his various sort of legal fights with the EU, for instance, there was one moment where he basically purged the judiciary of senior judges who he thought might stand up, um, might stand up to him. Um, and when the EU, one of the very few moments the EU actually uh, kicked back against him, of course, on age discrimination law, rather than the fact that he gutted his country and turned it into an authoritarian state. Um, he managed to just move himself sideways and go, well, okay, we've offered them their jobs back, but we can't get rid of the guys who are there right now because that would go against employment contracts. So we've offered the, the senior judges their jobs back, don't worry. He offered them sort of positions in, you know, in the provinces, which these guys, the most senior judges in the country, just simply weren't going to take. And of course, they, they didn't. He shows this constant canny ability, unlike someone like Donald Trump, unlike Bolsonaro, and actually unlike Johnson, who is profoundly inept in most of his policy decisions, to understand the situation legally and in terms of policy. So it's, it's difficult to underestimate, you know, his capacity to actually be quite intelligent and do the things that he thinks is required in order to pursue his um, agenda. So I wouldn't put it, you know, there are the circumstances, certainly, you know, the way in which he went was in line with lots of, sort of other countries, the entirety of the region, but he probably does deserve some credit. And in fact, some of the, the people I know in Hungary and have been talking to who are not fans of Orban and whose life has been made massively worse because of him, do give him grudging uh, credit for it. Mm, thank you. Not at all. Oh, next we've got Venetia. 
Hi there. Um, I'm interested in the seemingly contradictory role that the media play in all of this. Um, mm -hmm. You described that the media are attacked by nationalist I ideologues, um, but could you then also explain a bit why, why then they support that same narrative? Exa for example, the enemy of the people headline about Brexit. Yeah, yeah, because they're not just one thing. I mean, you know, because it isn't singular. Um, and by the way, this has happened throughout sort of liberal history, really. I mean, like, you know, liberalism kind of starts with the pamphlet. You know, when you take the printing press in sort of the 1600s, which had previously been, you know, this piece of tech that basically been used to make huge books for the nobility. And suddenly someone comes along and goes, well, let's just, if we just take one piece of paper and fold it and we can just, then we can do that. We can sell that for the price of a beer. And we can get that out. And that's really how radical literature starts. And the pamphlet turns into the newspaper. I mean, then, you know, the, the media has been from the very beginning, the information transfer system for radical ideas, which challenge power and support the individual. Then by the time you get someone like John Stuart Mill, um, you know, in the Victorian period, they're like, well, newspapers are kind of turning everyone into a homogenous block. You know, they're compounding the sense of convention and of kind of intellectual obedience and of not thinking for yourself. So even from the very earliest days, we have that sense of like the media can play both roles because it's free. It's not like the other institutions. Um, you know, we say, we start talking about four institutions, you know, legislature, executive, judiciary, and, and the press. And it, it has no sort of organizational structure. It bounces around all over. It's like a sort of bag of cats. Um, and so it can at the same time challenge power and at the same time you know, support agendas. And sometimes that happens within organizations. So, I mean, you know, if you look at the Daily Mail, um, oh, well, I mean, the Sun is like a much more simple beast. And um, you look at the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail is quite a complex sort of product, really. I mean, it was there, of course, doing the enemy of the people stuff during article, the Article 50 fight. And yet, when we got to the Cummings moment, I mean, the Cummings moment kind of typifying that way in which they had now become the incumbents, in which all the sort of attitudes that they had propounded outwards were now coming back and hitting them in the face. It was the male that was doing an awful lot of that running on the basis that it saw a sense of abject hypocrisy. So the thing is, there's no answer to that question because the media just isn't one thing. We talk about it in that way sometimes, in a way that's possibly not helpful because you have to talk about its general role. But in this and in all things, it will keep on bouncing both ways. What's really telling, I think, at the moment is the way that the government keeps on cocking up its relationship with the media. And it does it, you know, all the time in the lobby, by the way, it's treated the lobby, it does it in the way it treats TV journalists. It keeps on acting like they are the enemy. The same mistake, funny enough, which Jeremy Corbyn made right at the beginning. Um, and in that, it's turning otherwise, you know, quite sympathetic journalists um, against it and isn't quite getting that balance, isn't at all really getting that balance right and bringing the media more towards a critical stance towards it. Next question uh, is from another anonymous attendee. How much populism do we need to master to convince people to care about facts? And then in brackets, none? <laughs> none. <laughs> none at all. Jesus, none at all. Like, it, there is no, you know, if, if you were to now go, well, we are the people now. Hello, but let me put this in a better way. Like, you know, when I use that word minority, right? Like, um, the minority that sort of gets tyrannized by the tyranny of the majority. That's not just ever one group, right? Like you sink, you know, you could be targeted at one moment and then slink up into the majority um, and then be the minority all over again. The reason we don't use these terms is because it's not enough if we capture them. You know, it's not enough to just pretend that you're the people now, because eventually that'll get wielded against you once again. The reason that we use universal values of individual freedoms and of reason, of things that apply to all people, regardless of anything else about them, is because that is the way to make humanity as a whole more free to improve the quality of their life for everyone. So we don't mimic, we do not mimic, we do not accept the fundamentals of the narrative. And part of that is, you know, I mean, in sort of look at political science, they often call this framing, right? Like the, the real victory of nationalism actually came a long time, like, you know, when you're getting into like the late 1990s, the early noughties, when if you take the immigration debate, the frame was immigration is a problem. It's like, you know, for welfare, you never heard about, you know, the idea that welfare was actually there to protect people when they needed help, when they're out of a job. You heard a lot about that, you know, in the post-war period, you know, up until really sort of the Reaganite Thatcher revolution in the 70s. You'd hear quite a bit about that. Then you didn't hear it. It was benefits are a problem. You know, benefits suck away taxpayers' money. Immigrants are a problem. They got the frame. And then, you know, you get sort of nationalists go on TV. You get like a tough BBC journalist, you know, taking on Nigel Farage, taking on Marine Le Pen. And they're like, well, look, I asked them all of the tough questions. And you're like, yeah, but the thing is, you accept the frame, the frame of the discussion. You fundamentally have accepted the values. 
And once you do that, you keep on getting answers that you don't want because you've already accepted the starting assumptions of what you're dealing with. We do not accept their starting assumptions. Like you, there's no amount of populism that will ever work in our direction. And even if it did, we'd still get our asses handed to us in the end anyway. Thank you. Next question is from Ruth. Hi there, thanks for talk, it's really interesting. This might be a simple question. Um, why is it that uh, populist or nationalist leaders are so hell-bent on denying that COVID existed? Mm. No, I don't think it's simple at all. Um, and so, you know, again, like they're all different, right? But a lot of them have drunk the Kool-Aid. Like a lot of them are actually properly either dumb or, or, or mad. Um, and Bolsonaro and Trump, I would say, both fit into that category. So they are conspiracy theorists. So I actually, when they say deep state, you know, instead of, you know, restraining executive power, I, I do believe that they believe it. Um, and so when it comes along that someone comes up with something complex that looks like it's against their interest, of course, no leader wants coronavirus. I mean, of course, nobody wants coronavirus. And I'm sure opposition leaders went out there, you know, rubbing their hands with glee, thinking this will work out well for my political prospects. But a guy who's, especially when you're about to go into an election like Donald Trump, is, you really don't want it because you know it's going to smash the economy. So you're being presented with something that is complicated, that is coming from a group that you think of as your natural enemies, you know, the deep state or, you know, whatever you want to call a public health agency or the pandemic surveillance um, office. Um, and so you basically just go for the conspiracy theory which ultimately is, you know, what these guys do with almost every single problem. Like when you look at the private accounts of the stuff that Donald Trump says, you know, about people coming in over the border or whatever, he's just as mad, you know, in private as he is in public. Right? You can see him in public. You think this is not a guy that's putting on an act, much as some people tried to suggest he was at the beginning. He really is that guy. Um, and pretty much the same with Bolsonaro. Boris Johnson is a far more complex, you know, sort of, well, complex, that seems too generous, but you know, he's a far more nuanced figure and he's obviously, he's smarter than they are. He's obviously jumping on this stuff in order to um, pursue it. And for that reason, there was a much more moderate approach from him. He never denied that it existed. He was just sort of slow and useless rather than actively malevolent um, in, in the manner in which he pursued it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Orsina. Hi, Ian. Um, thanks for your uh, uh, lecture tonight. So, the young people uh, in the world today, they're incredibly um, engaged, um, informed, um, and yet they're also the ones that are hit hardest by everything. You know, there are no jobs, no housing, they've got the debt that's going to hurt them, the climate crisis. You know, you and I are like white middle class men, we'll be dead long before the climate crisis really kicks in, but our children are the ones who are going to have to pay the price. They are angry and full of energy and informed. How can we take, um, take best advantage of, of that energy and, and, and harness it? I mean, I, I sort of, I, I, I feel like I see it happening all, all the time. I feel like the edges of things when we look at something like Extinction Rebellion and when we look at something like Black Lives Matter are talked about mostly in our values. Well, I'm sorry, I'm saying oh, I, I don't know <laughs> where you come from, but I, I think the, like the word liberalism isn't particularly popular at the moment. Um, but ultimately, that's when most, you look at Extinction Rebellion, right? Extinction Rebellion deals exclusively in talking about, uh, sorry, when it talks about, you know, climate science and the idea that science matters and that reason and empiricism matter. So the, the, the sort of the spectacle, which I saw, you know, back in the days when I used to go to Parliament to work, of seeing, you know, sort of 12, 13 year old kids outside protesting who had a much firmer grasp of science and a much deeper commitment to it than the sort of 60 year old cabinet secretaries and peers who are walking in. Like it seems like those debates are conducted in those terms. And so when we talk about Black Lives Matter, you know, as much as I see lots of, I mean, I basically think it's white supremacists online, but I know that they try to pretend otherwise with this sort of, you know, all lives matter, but it's like, I, I, if you were just at least brave enough to just state the fact that you're a racist, that would make everybody much more comfortable. Um, when they sort of come against it, in, in fact, what they say is it's black power who wants to destroy it. You don't really see any of that, right? What you see is people talking about, we demand equal treatment, individual freedoms. Now those ideas, those are liberal ideas. You know, those are progressive basic ideas. And for those alliances to be made seems to me tremendously easy. And I don't even, it's not even some kind of magic thing. I mean, it seems to me like they're being made all of the time. And that there's an energy now that comes from being like the barbarians at the gate. 
from being the resistance to something rather than the status quo of something. That means that, you know, we have to, you have to have an idea of your politics as being much more open, being much more passionate than it was before, the kind of old technocratic liberalism that you saw, especially in the 90s and the noughties, is gone. So you get that sense of commitment, but I do think those alliances are being formed right now from groups that we think about as these sort of distinct clusters, but in fact are not. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from George. Oh, good evening. Um, Ian and uh, Camilla, thank you very much for putting on this presentation. Um, I'd, yeah, um, I'd, um, I'd like to ask you uh, if you can define the difference between nationalism and patriotism. Mm -hmm. And um, and you mentioned the uh, this uh, ruling elite, which I agree with you. Um, now, it seems to me that anybody who pops their head above the parapet and tries to name these ruling elites, be it the Bilderbergs or Bohemia Grove, or whatever, experiences the same fate as Julian Assange. Now, Julian Assange is rotting away in Belmarsh prison, and there's no <coughs> campaign on the left to get him out. There's no campaigns or anything going on. And it seems to me that anybody who, you know, you know whether you're on the left or you're on the right, if you try to challenge the status quo, you get hammered. Mm, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I see people around me challenging the status quo all, all the time. Um, and no, but I mean, there's a, a really hammer it. You know, like if you really, really try to uh, get people thinking. I mean, Julian Assange, I mean, I've seen the videos that have all got D notices on now. You know, like, and, you know, and because he had the guts to, to challenge the elite, he rots away in Belmarsh prison. <laughs> Let's be honest yeah, about it. I'm not, I'm not with you on the Guardian newspaper. Doesn't I, I, exist on him. I'm not with you on the Julian Assange part. But let me talk. Like the question you asked about um, patriotism and, and nationalism is, yeah, is really, yeah. Um, it's a really good one. Uh, so to me, and you know, I think this is a good workable definition. Is this is that um, patriotism comes from the individual, and it's their sense of love. It's their love story about the group that they happen to be in. Um, it is individually chosen. Nationalism is imposed from above on the individual. It speaks of humans as homogenous blobs, as kind of windowless boxes. That's what Isaiah Berlin called them. Just one mass unit. Patriotism is a love story and it comes from within. You know, when you look at someone like George Orwell talking about what made him love England, you can agree or disagree with the stuff that he came up with. I mean, it's kind of sepia tinted stuff. Um, but he talks about, you know, the cup of tea and the football match and this idea that even the communal activities are non-state. That, that is a man finding what there is for him to love about his country. It comes, it springs from within rather than being imposed from without. And that difference has been there again throughout sort of modern history. One of them, the first one is profoundly healthy. If you happen to feel it, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't, but if you do, it's profoundly healthy, it's personal, it's individual. The other always leads to the same grim place. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from S. Vaughan. Oh, hi. Um, <clears throat> well, in the US, the, the polarization of the public sphere is very intense. And it, worse than that, it's also armed. Uh, Trump has encouraged armed resistance to his delusionary and dangerous views, meaning the importance for us to speak up and to repeat objective truths has become potentially a violent experience, discouraging speaking up and truth speaking by people and experts in media. Um, how would you say this is different and can be uh, better combated than what's going on in the UK? Yeah, I mean, it is very different to what's going on in the UK. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Um, and the guns is part of it. I mean, that makes it much less scary. Um, I think there's also a part of it, which is the, the lack of a racial element um, and the lack of a racial history there. The thing, you know, it's, it's well trodden ground. But like ultimately, it still defines almost everything you see in American politics is that race is part of it from slavery onwards. Um, and that is something that, that Britain doesn't have. It's not like Britain isn't racist. Of course it is. It has those problems, but it doesn't have the same deeply entrenched sort of foundation in the manner in which the country talks about almost any issue. Um, there's also, I think, that the sort of leveling influence of the BBC by having at least a space, a major space, especially when you take in local radio, local BBC radio, which is listened to an awful lot in this country and trusted actually quite highly, but people don't really mention very much. 
it provides some sort of corrective to the kind of frenzied culture war hatred that you get from Fox News. I mean, Fox News were the guys that put it in Donald Trump's head to try all sorts of different drugs um, to, to tackle coronavirus. So the differences are huge. And I won't pretend otherwise that, you know, it's, it's more difficult for the US. The US has one advantage, which is that I know getting rid of Trump doesn't fix everything, but it does take care of the immediate problem. Whereas the changes that Britain is making to its society through Brexit are structural generational changes that will make you know already poor people even poorer and therefore potentially more susceptible to these kinds of narratives. Thank you. Uh, next question is from an anonymous attendee that starts out, happy for you to read this out. Um, thanks Ian for the comments you've made. Whilst in the countries you've mentioned, the nationalists have control of levers of governmental power, largely due to specific electoral systems, in terms of popular support, there's a stubborn 50% of the population that don't support the governing party. What are the implications of this for combating nationalists in power? Yeah, well, and that, that percentage is getting sort of bigger all the time, right? The people that don't support these guys. I mean, you look honestly at the polling case after case, and a lot of that is basically the incumbency. It's incumbency during a crisis. You start by getting a spike of support. Boris Johnson got it, you know, Donald Trump got it, or sort of liberal leaders like and Macron, to a, to a more limited extent, got it. And then there was precipitous decline. Again, the same for someone like Macron. It's not just the nationalists that experience this. But because they've made such a big zero of it, it's more polarizing for them. And of course, because the narrative is the people versus the elite, they are more susceptible to the damage when you see them become so profoundly unpopular. So look, I mean, that movement is happening now, and it's up to us to make sure that it continues. Thank you. Next question is from Evan. Oh, oh no, Am I, do I keep muting you? <laughs> I'm asking. Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Hi, Ian. Hi. Um, I didn't come in too late, but I, this is really a question about the fundamentals of democracy, of which I've <laughs> written, just written a book on. Um, uh, have we really got to a stage where this, uh, the polarisation that takes place in politics in general, be it from populists or nationalists or whatever, isn't it time we sort of got away from that model of doing democracy? Is, is that the, the, the party system, for me, is the one which is, is deeply suspicious? I mean, they, 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 they do everything to win power. They, they're, they're the whole approach... And, and they tell lies, of course, we know that well. Uh, and as soon as they're in a position that they want to see power come in, they will not move. That's why Brexit came to a standstill, because uh, Corbyn thought if he, if he moved cleverly, he would be able to get into power. Isn't that the fundamental problem? Shouldn't we start looking at the way we do democracy? I don't know whether you're interested in this type of stuff or not. I, yeah, I mean, I am, so, you know, because I am the kind of nerd that I am, I obviously, you know, I have the kind of friends that want to talk a lot about electoral reform. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine how many, you know, vibrant discussions there are about different... No, I'm talking about getting rid of elections. Elections are the problem. They are the problem. I'm not, I, obviously, I'm not so keen on getting rid of elections. And I do understand your point about political parties, and I've always felt a little bit um, weird about them, and I certainly, myself as an individual, could never really see myself joining one. Um, you get into a, tr I mean, the trouble is, of course, is that they're very hard to make go away. And even if you got rid of them, you know, when you look at, so you look at like the French revolutionary period, I'm going far back, but you have to really. Um, uh, when people, you know, were very opposed to the idea of factionalism. And yet you still saw all these groups come out, you know, the Montagnards and the Girondines and, you know, on the street, the M. Rajas and Bar. I mean, you, it's even when you, your whole political culture is against factionalism. Again, the, the factions just seem to just form constantly because people have allegiances, not just of ideas, not just on particular topics, but also, you know, of sort of self-interest and of mutual advancement. So they're very hard to get rid of. Um, I, do, I mean, th there does need to be extensive constitutional reform in this country. I wouldn't go as far as getting rid of elections. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think that's the way to go. Thank you. Next question from Arjun. Hello. Um, one of the features I see of populism is a winner-takes-all approach to politics. Is it actually worthwhile, um, as more as a liberal, to try to f seek an agreement with politicians and people who have that attitude? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you would sort of find that agreement. I mean, you're right, like, especially the idea of um, a zero-sum game, um, which you sort of essentially get whenever you think of politics as two competing classes of people, one of which you know wins everything and the other gets nothing. Um, rather than the liberal democratic approach, which is always that, you know, people have competing interests, they have competing rights, and you need to balance it, and not everyone's ever going to be fully happy, and you've got to come up with all this pedestrian day-by-day, case-by-case policy making. I mean, no one likes that. It's really boring, and it doesn't offer this great glorious future for, you know, your tribe. Um, but it works, and it improves people's lives, and it makes them more free and wealthier and happier. Um, so that's the way that, that we have to pursue it. You, I mean... That seems to me it just plays into that thing of you can't accept the frame. You can't accept the values. Like every time this is talked about in that way, you have to challenge it. And of course, it gets talked about in that way, not just in the grand narrative, but in all of the individual bits of the debate. Like when you listen to Trump talk about trade, for Trump, trade is a zero-sum game. Right? He thinks that if you've got a trade deficit, you're a loser. And rather than the fact that it's actually like, well, you just want to buy more stuff from this guy. You know, it's, it's not such a bad world to be in where you can buy lots of electronic products from China. That's quite nice. Um, so again, you see that permeating everything. You're entirely right to sort of uh, single it out. Um, but it, in each moment, you have to challenge that idea within the minutiae of what you're discussing and within the broader narrative of what you're discussing. Great. Thank you. Next, we have Liz. Ooh, I feel like as soon as I press the unmute button, they are doing Hi. it at the same time. Liz, are you there? <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yay! <laughs> I was, I was um, just grabbing some cheese. Um, <laughs> I, very sensible. Thank you both very much for an incredible um, evening. I was just going to ask, I mean, given that, Ian, you, you sort of have alluded to the fact that we are in a situation where objective reality and nuance have kind of gone the way of the dodo, do you see us being able to move back to a situation where these things actually do matter in politics? And if so, how and when? And, and, uh, and in particular, do you see the whole rise of whatever you want to call them, deep fakes and uh, use, the use of AI to produce um, fake news that's ever more convincing being uh, relevant? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, looking at that, that's like the hardest battle, right, is the technological battle, which is, you know, this is not all just about ideology, it's not even just about economics, it's not about identity, it's also the technological battle that we face. Um, and that comes in a variety of forms. I mean, one of them is when you get pernicious state actors like Russia. I mean, Russia's role in lots of things is overstated. Um, and it was sort of a crutch, I think, for a lot of, especially Remainers afterwards to go, well, wow, it would have turned out differently if it wasn't for Putin. I don't think that's really the case. Um, but nevertheless, the disinformation campaign from Russia it had always had two things on it, whether it was in the Ukraine or whether it was in Britain or whether it was in the US, which was in order to say, well, we're going to take, we're going to get our narrative across on this one matter, but also more importantly, we're going to take away your ability to ever really know if something's true. And as you're pointing out, it's stuff like deep fakes, that problem will get worse. There's also the issue of our own emotional reaction to things, right? Like online, on social media, every day. Most people now, you know, most Americans get in their news through Facebook. When you look at the fake news that was spread by Bolsonaro about coronavirus, most of that was translated through WhatsApp groups. Um, and that requires talking to people about their own behavior online. And this is like the hardest part in the bar that is mo probably most difficult to fix, is that you have to have a space inside you that is quiet and contemplative. <laughs> you know, it's not like we all have to be Zen masters, but we have to have a bit of us that isn't instantly affected by tribalism and emotion online. Now, the algorithms on social media respond most effectively to tribalism and emotion. That's what gets the most shares, that's what gets the most likes. And it is essentially a hack of the lowest part of the human brain. Um, the need for variable rewards, the need for, um, you know, to be seen as virtuous by your own group. In all of these cases, we need to find a way of learning how to assess information, of learning how to keep part of us that is individual, that is autonomous, in a space that is essentially designed just to secure your attention by using the most base elements of the brain. And I'm not going to pretend I have easy answers for that, because the only real answer is just to try and educate people about how to do that, about the need, the moral need, but also like the personal need 
to do that stuff and to, to behave that way yourself online to create social norms around it that is like a long term it's a long term project I, I accept but there are you know and I don't know of any other answers thank you um, so the next couple of questions are from anonymous attendees um, what do you think a harsh second wave would do to the populistic hold by the Tories in this country yeah it's going to make it uh, much harder for them and it's going to be make it much harder um, depending on what happens in other countries. And the worst situation for them is, you know, if, if Brits are stuck at home while watching, you know, news footage of other countries, you know, being able to go to restaurants and go back to cinemas and blah, blah, blah which you were starting to get at the end of, you know, the, the last wave, we were seeing countries like New Zealand, and you know, being able to open up and we were all still stuck inside. So of course, you know, from this point on, the longer it goes on for, the more economic damage, the more effect on our social lives, the worse it's gonna get um, for the government. Uh, it's not like, you know, this is a good thing to happen. You do not want this to happen, especially, you know, if we have to go through six months of it, that's going to be very, very grim indeed. But I think the fundamental political reality right now is the moment that they had support electorally is now seriously damaged. You have a narrative in the form of Dominic Cummings of one rule for them, another rule for us, which is profoundly toxic to the kind of government they're trying to run, which is based on inverting that, that against other people. Um, so, essentially, the next few years are going to be decisive, and there's plenty of opportunities there to make them own the things that they are doing, as long as we go about it in the right way. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Hi, Ian. Thanks for such an enlightening talk. What do you think are the most effective ways to resist populism? Um, okay, so, I mean, like, there's, there's, like, various levels for this. I mean, the first one is, um, actually, within organisations. So the organizations are part of the fight at all times. And one of the most obvious is political parties by getting inside them and trying to agitate for their own, for the manner in which they approach things. You know, and that, by the way, includes the Conservative Party, right, which has purged um, its sort of one nation, its moderates. Um, and yet there are plenty of sort of liberal minded people who are you know, quite right wing economically who they're not going to want to go into Labour. And you never know which way the Lib Dems are going to fall. I mean, if the Lib Dems fall in their orange book way, then maybe they'll be comfortable there. But if they fall, you know, for instance, under Leila Moran, in a more left-wing position, most Conservatives wouldn't. So for whatever your... The fight against populism operates independently of where you are on the left-right spectrum. You know, you have a responsibility to keep your house in order. If you happen to be on the right, if you happen to be on the left, that's the house you keep in order. Everyone is susceptible to this stuff. The same goes for organizations campaigning, you know, for free speech, um, you know, against detention centers, um, you know, or on things like drug reform, you know, on much broader sort of liberal issues. And then the, the part that's most important is, again, you know, you as an individual, of you in each conversation, refusing to accept those ideas, of not being cowed down and being told that you're not part of the people, you don't understand your own country, and, you know, you're just like an elitist. When, in fact, the people that get punished for this are always the most marginalized, the most vulnerable that constantly get it in the net, you know, that are drowning in the med, that are caught up in the hostile environment, that are separated from their kids in Trump's um, detention centers. Those are the guys that get punished. So every time you're told, you know, you're, you're just part of the elite, you just think like, well, no, I know that I stand up for the most vulnerable. So to keep that commitment and that confidence about yourself when you argue for these issues, ultimately that's it. You can work in the organizations and you kind of must, that's the way it works. But the fire of it, that comes from each conversation you have in the office, you know, at the dinner table, in the pub, I mean, you know, in the days when we actually used to go to any of these places um, online, but that's where it comes from, from, from the individual. Great, thank you. Next question, also from an anonymous attendee. Given that Johnson is an opportunist, why do you think he has so far kept Cummings on as his advisor, given how much damage he's already caused to Johnson's opinion poll ratings? Yeah, because he's completely dependent on him. Um, so, I mean, he, you know, he saw him he would have obviously come across him when he was working for Michael Gove at the Department of Education, where he was already completely mad. Um, and then saw him during the Vote Leave campaign. And, you know, during the Vote Leave campaign, he hugely impressed him. Like, you know, this is a guy who was using the data, who he thought had a sense of this intuitive sense of, you know, how the public were going. He delivered for him then, and he delivered for him again during the last general election, essentially by saying, country split in two. Um, that side split among several parties and this side we can just hoover it all up which is not you know the most genius sort of level political strategy but it works for him there's also this thing that you know, boris johnson doesn't really know why he wanted power in the first place so there's a guy here that provides 
a sort of a sense of purpose, right? Like they're going to do something, you know, apparently that thing is reform the civil service in a way that they can't quite specify. And apparently that's some kind of great mythical destiny that they have. Nevertheless, at least there's a narrative there, a thing that they want to do, a purpose for what is being done. So on both tactics and on the broader sort of, you know, watercolor paint of, of how they want to proceed, he provides him, you know, with, with success and with a sense of, of, of objectives. And on that reason, he will cling to him until the very end, like the very, very bitter end. Right, he's a bit like a nanny in that respect. <laughs> um, <laughs> Your nannies are more loyal, clearly. Uh, next from Bemi, who might have a couple of questions, I think. All right, uh, hello, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. yeah. Okay, I've got two questions. So just firstly, um, during the Brexit debate, um, we saw this divide between EU and non-EU citizens. So, and I felt that sometimes it felt, it, it seemed like in some cases, EU citizens were seen as the more deserving citizens. So for example, EU citizens were seen as more as a net contributor to the system or they, or, or more migration came from the non-EU citizens. And I just think that kind of damaged the whole remain liberal cause. And I think if we really want to like progress, if we really want to progress um, um, a liberal cause, then I think there needs to be a bit more solidarity amongst that. There just seems to be this segregation. Okay, Mate, sorry, and, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do, do you mean um, between EU citizens and, and other immigrants? Yes. Oh, yeah. Got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, Frank. I mean, I'm, I'm. I'm sure you can tell from my accent that I'm non-EU, but mm -hmm. I, I just noticed this kind of divide, which I think was quite damaging and it was quite offensive in some mm -hmm. ways. And I am quite sim. I am sympathetic to Remain because I voted Remain, obviously. But it just seems like that there wasn't that kind of um, togetherness between EU and non and the non-EU citizens. There needed to be some sort of solidarity, but there was this split. And my question is how do we push back against that? Because that definitely, that undermines the liberal cause, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and you're right that there's always, there's, because you know, it's wrapped up in a bunch of stuff, right? It's also wrapped up in ideas of race. It's also wrapped up in ideas that generally, there, there is typically an economic divide. It's modest, but it, but it is there that um, economically speaking, EU migrants were generally more advantageous to the economy than uh, non-EU migrants. That's from a UCL study. I mean, it's like a few billion, you know, it's not nothing, but it's not a lot. Um, and I think there was, um, okay, now let me put it this way. In the immigration debate, which I've been doing now for like, what, like 10 years, there's always this kind of struggle between an ideal and an immediate practicality of a debate. And the ideal is, you know, you want all immigrants treated decently. The immediate practicality is that you will usually get more um, a more successful uh, strategy with the media by doing basically the good immigrant thing, right? Like, you know, this immigrant was a translator in Afghanistan, you know, so they have one, and, you know, this immigrant works in a hospital, you know, so apparently he ends it rather than, you know, someone that you know, works in a corner shop. Um, and the, there's a, the reality is, I think, either side, going on either side of that, is damaging. Like if, if that's all you do, the good immigrant stuff, then you just corrode any kind of value at the heart of your campaign. But if you refuse to do any of it, you lose individual debates, right? Let's say you can't help Syrian refugees, um, like as we did after the um, 2015, I think it was 2015, yeah. Um, and you probably get the same, I mean, you have the same concerns now with, um, in a different way than we had during the EU result, when we talk about sort of essential workers. Well, you know, the question is, well, why should an immigrant have to be an essential worker in order for you to admire them? But of course, if you don't use that terminology, you're losing an opening to make people realize that Im immigrants as a whole are not something that damages your society, they're someone that enriches it. So I kind of think like it's always really important to have people asking the question that you're asking right now and keeping people aware of it, but also to try and make sure that in each case you're thinking to yourself, what can be gained here? How am I speaking about things so that we're both like pragmatic and idealistic at the same time in the way that we fight for immigration? I know that's not a very satisfying answer, I hope it's okay. Thank you. There is another question from Bemi as well uh, that you didn't ask, but it's a really good question. I'm trying to unmute you. <laughs> <laughs> um, hold on. There, there we go. I promise I know how to use Zoom. <laughs> I'm 
wonder if both me and Bemi are pressing the, the mute unmute button at the same time. Are you there, Bemi? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I've got you. Okay, perfect. So as we um, get closer to um, December, which is, you know, the, the when the transition expires, um, um, you know, and we are closer to this um, magical deal by Boris Johnson, what, what can we do to, how, I think we need to lobby oppositional MPs to just do something and not like just sit back and, you know, and let the shit hit the roof. What should we be doing? Um, so I'm, these MPs to do something and yeah, I'm tired of hearing will of the people and stuff like that. By the way, that was a populist, populist mem, will of the people, but I, I digress. What should we do? Uh, like I've got bad news here. So the first, the first one is it's kind of too late. And I don't mean from the Brexit, uh, from leaving the EU. I mean, from, um, the period with, you know, the end of last month for extending the transition. Um, so that period legally, you, you, you you're kind of a bit stuck. Um, and the things that are about to happen are damaging most of all to communities that just voted for the Conservatives, Labour communities that just voted Conservatives, the Midlands and the North. Predominantly because, you know, in the South, like in London, you're not really dealing with a lot of manufacturing. You're dealing primarily with services. Um, but manufacturing heavily, you know, Midlands, Northern seats, and they're about to get damaged by tariffs if there's no deal. But even if there is rules of origin checks, regulatory checks, customs clearance requirements, extremely laborious, especially for small and medium sized businesses. The typical way the world always works, the despairing predictability of it, the people who can least afford it, the ones who get hammered the worst. So what we can do now, and it's all we can do now, because let's not pretend we've got executive power. And let's not pretend that I, I have to say, I think much would be accomplished by having, you know, Keir Starmer or Remainers say, definitely you got to deal because you know, the first thing they want to do is the exact opposite of what you're saying, is just to make sure that people understand what is happening and why. That it's a result of the deal that they are doing. That it's a result of how they've approached this thing, that these consequences are spilling out. The mo I know it's a despairing analysis, but the most we can do is anchor down that sense of what is, of causation, of what is objectively taking place here. Make sure, again, I don't want to keep on repeating myself, make sure that they damn well own it what they are doing, because that is the quickest way to alleviate it. It's the quickest way of getting them out of power. It's the quickest way to actually try and help those people. We're kind of out of power for, for taking control of it right now, but we're not out of power to try and rectify the damage that they do as early as possible. Great, thank you. Um, so we've just got a comment, not a question, uh, but uh, Yasmina says, I just wanted to thank Ian for this evening's talk, which I think is an absolutely delightful note to end on. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Ian. That was really, really interesting. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. You can get a copy of Ian's book. Um, we've got a link on our website. Um, I should also, while I'm here, hold on, I'm going to repost our donation button. Uh, please do donate to the charity uh, because we work really hard. Um, and yeah, thank you again, Ian. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, we'll be back on 26th, uh, Sunday, the 26th of July with Beverly Clack. Um, who is a professor of philosophy of religion at Oxford Brookes University um, and she will be talking about how to be a failure and still live well so I will definitely be tuning in for that and um, thanks <laughs> Ian have <laughs> a lovely evening and weekend uh, you're all great and yes uh, see you soon cheers bye bye bye